How is the shift from employee engagement to how is the shift from fulfillment reshaping the definition of success in the workplace? Well, rise and shine leaders, this is Glenn Guyton, keynote speaker and workplace trainer. Welcome to our executive coffee break. I've got my beverage in hand. I hope you have yours too. They say you can't choose your family, but you can choose your workplace culture and your beverage. And today I'm drinking coffee. Leadership matters, so you might as well get good at it. Well, I'll tell you what sparked today's episode. I saw an article that said employee engagement is dead. Is it? Because that's all we talk about now. How do we engage employees? And I talk about that employee engagement. But I came across an article from a company that says employee engagement is dead. So what does that mean? Let's talk about it just a little bit. Think about the traditional view of workplace culture. You know, everything that's going on now, and it's, it's really shifting, right? How we think about workplace culture is shifting. Traditionally, workplace culture focused on efficiency, and productivity, often at the cost of employee well-being. Of course, we talk about metrics and engagement surveys or how we try to assess what's going on in the workplace. But did they capture the full picture? And so as we think about this traditional approach, it really shaped the workplace. and. It imposed, I think, some limitations on both the employee and the leaders. Really, it was all about the data. All about the data, all about the productivity. We meet certain benchmarks, and then you would reward reward the employees. But I think we're finding out that wasn't enough or isn't enough in the workplace. And so what are we focusing on now? Uh, For many years, we talked about workplace, life balance. I think that was a fallacy. I don't think that really existed. But now moving out of the global pandemic, I think we're faced with the reality that employees have more power than they did previously, or at least they're exercising that power. I think they've always had this, had that power. I, I was listening to an ESP. Not ESPN. He's not even on ESPN anymore. Uh, Bomani Jones was talking about storming the court. You know, after after basketball game in college, they stormed the court. And how are they able to do that? Because, you know, if you as an individual just walked onto the court, the security will stop you. Correct? Right? You can't just walk onto a football field. You can't just run on, onto a basketball court as an individual. But when the collective does it, when you have 10,000, 2,000 fans dedicated to achieve a purpose, it happens, right? Security can't do a thing. They really can't. Security can't do a thing if a significant portion of the stadium decides to break the rules. And I think post-COVID, many employees said, hey, we have some power now. Uh, we have collectively decided that things in the workplace were going, going to change, and we as leaders have to respond to that. And, and employees really haven't even tapped into the full power that they that they have. So let's talk about the shift toward employee and fill, uh, fulfillment, employee fulfillment. Uh, it's a it's a big shift from seeing employees just as mere cogs. In the machine, you know, pushing out widgets to recognizing them as an integral part of the, the workplace, seeing them as contributors with unique needs and aspirations, right? Now we focus more on the individual. The transition is not just about making employees happy, but really unlocking their full potential. Why, why, why would we want to make our employees happy? That's, the, that's so crazy. That's such a crazy concept. Uh, that's that's part of the shift, right? Fulfillment encompasses personal growth, meaningful work, and a sense of purpose. 
that transcends traditional engagement. So this is this started a while back. Uh, purpose having employees connected to a purpose or having companies connected to a purpose, right? It's not just uh, you know, back when they had the Model T, I think there was a quote from Ford saying, hey, you can get a Model T in any color that you want as long as it's black, right? So that was, hey, look, we don't even care about the customer back then. Like, we have the product. You're going to buy it. This is how we design it. And you don't have a choice. Uh, and then Apple, some other companies later on started, you know, personalizing things. So there was a difference between the PC and and the Apple computer, and you could get different colors. You remember all the colors that Apple had? I don't know if that went too well, but they, they did have at least some options for you. Even iPhones, iPhones have options, different colors and things like that. So we started changing a little bit, and then you had that company that makes the shoes, what I think is Tom's. You know, hey, you buy one shoe, we'll give a shoe to, to someone in another country that doesn't have shoes. And so social responsibility came up to be a big part of uh, these new companies, and that, that translated into uh, employees want to have a purpose, feel like they're giving back. And so how do we how do we do that? How do we continue to do that in uh, the workplace? I think that's a transition that we're going to have to consider. I know some of the organizations that I've worked with, they have a significant, uh, they, they have a significant effort toward engaging their community. So it's not just about the corporation, but it's having the employees go and volunteer, uh, do charitable work, and so now we are seeing more and more of that integration that people don't want to just come and get paid. They do, but I don't know if that's the primary driver like it used to be. Um, young people are staying at home longer, living with their parents. And so there's also not the economic drive. Well, one thing, they can't afford to buy their own homes and things like that, but <clears throat> they don't need to make as much money. They want, they want to do something that's, that's meaningful. That's not every. That's not everyone, but there there is a shift. <clears throat> Excuse me. There is a shift happening with that, as we see people want to uh, want their work to reflect their values. And so, how do you, as a leader, address that? What is the role of leadership in, in shaping culture? The evolution of workplace culture spotlights the transformative role of leadership. Today's leaders are not just decision makers, but visionaries who shape the culture. We need more visionary leaders. We've had visionary leaders in the past, but we need more. We need a greater percentage of visionary leaders in the workplace. They understand that fostering an environment of trust, inclusivity, and wellness is paramount. It's going to be, it's going to be critical for the next few iterations of, of work. By empowering employees and valuing their contribution, contributions, leaders can cultivate a culture of fulfillment that drives innovation and performance. We want to drive innovation and performance. So again, early on, all we cared about was performance and you know being the best in the marketplace. And we still care about that, right? But we have to do it in a different way. We still want to make profits in organizations. You still want to make profits if you are a for-profit organization. If you're a nonprofit organization, you still want to accomplish your mission, but you have to manage your people differently. You have to manage your people differently. So who are a few of the thought leaders in this area? Just to just to give you a few, um, some trailblazers, trailblazers who've redefined success by prioritizing fulfillment and sharing that information with the world. From innovative startups to established corporations, um, there are many leaders out there that are doing things to help improve uh, employee retention drive creativity, and to help you get a stronger bottom line. Just a few few I'll name. You, you, you can look, look these people up on your own. Brene Brown, you're probably familiar with her books. Simon Sinek, um, well-known. He emphasized the importance of strong, positive organizational culture. Laszlo Bach, look him up. Adam Grant from the Wharton School of Business. Uh, Let's see who else. Uh, Francis Frey and Ann Morris, Rosalind Torres, Cheryl Sandberg. Uh, she's a COO of Facebook. So these are just a few people that I've thought of that are helping to drive uh, some of these different things in the in the workplace. Uh, and one that I thought was very very interesting 
and I'm going to pull her up on my screen. But I thought it's at least that she's worth worth a look, worth worth us thinking about today is Mar uh, Marissa Hamamoto uh, from L.A. Uh, she's doing some some interesting work with with dance and inclusion. Uh, her story is a fascinating one. Maybe I'll put her her link in the description uh, for the re replay. Uh, but check her check her out. I think uh, you would find interesting work with with dance and inclusion. Uh, her story is a fascinating one. Maybe I'll put her her link in the description uh, for the re replay. Uh, but check her check her out. I think uh, you would find interesting work with with dance and inclusion. Uh, her story is a fascinating one. Maybe I'll put her her link in the so check that out. Just people that are are, are bringing different types of energy to the workplace. Uh, so what type of energy are you bringing to your workplace? Are you thinking outside of the box? Yes. Are you thinking outside of the box? Are you thinking a little bit more with, with some more creativity as you lead? Uh, look at the changing work workforce. I know when millennials first entered the workplace, and it, you know, of course, this is years ago, because millennials, you all are old now. Uh, but when millennials first entered the workforce, baby boomers and even some Gen Xers were pushing against against them saying hey they're they're lazy you know they're so sensitive and, and all of these things and so now millennials are in more significant roles of authority baby boomers are slowly moving out of the workplace and so I think there's a more recognition that we need to change how we how we treat people and uh, there's not as much loyalty to the institution as there was before and so the new leader has to learn how to operate in this, this environment and I think millennials are going to be challenged a little bit of uh, leading Gen Z, uh, Gen Z, uh, they don't. I, I would say, I mean, I'm phrasing this as a Gen X, right? They care even less about the institution. They care even less about just the drive to to produce and, and be productive as a whole. Now, of course, you always have individuals, but as a whole, this is a generalization. But as a whole, I think they care less about the whole corporate rat race that's so to find these previous generations and worked was such a big defining characteristic of who you, who you are. I think we're moving away from that uh, pretty quickly, um, uh, especially, again, these younger generations, I think, are moving away from, from that mindset. So you have to learn how to create a sense of purpose at work. So here's my challenge for you today. Identify one area in your organization where you can Transition from focusing solely on engagement to fostering true fulfillment. Uh, it could be as simple as implementing flexible work hours or as complex as redefining your company values. Ooh, do you want to do that? So what step will you take this week to enrich your workplace culture? Now, this is I'm talking to people to have some power. Now, if you're the um, lower level worker, mid-level manager, you're not going to be able to really redefine your company's value. This is going to have to come from the senior VP, CEO level. So if you're a CEO, senior executive, think about that. Do you need to uh, sit down and redefine your workplace culture? And, I, and I've worked with an organization that we've done this. It took a lot of work. Um, we brought everyone together uh, for this event to, to try to quickly re-examine who we were as an organization to reset the culture. And you know what? We didn't come up with a whole bunch of new stuff, but the, the exercise was rewarding in itself because it helped people refocus on why they were a part of the organization. It helped some people. Some people didn't. I just want to be honest with you. But I do think the, ex the exercise helped me as an executive do my job better. Why? Because I was able to point people to our values. This is what we do. This is what we stand for. And this is how we execute these values. And so that exercise helped remind, helped remind people of why the organization existed in the, in the first place. So think about it. Think about what you're going to do. It could be, again, it could be something as simple as flexible work hours. And I worked with a, 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 I was working with a guy. He was telling me that they decided, the employees, now the employees did decide this. Hey, we're going uh, to keep working remotely. 
the uh, senior leader said, no, you're coming back to the office. Then everybody got sick. Because it was amazing, right? They basically did a sick out. Again, they, they stormed the court and said, hey, no, we have the power to uh, influence our workplace culture. We don't care what you say. I, in, the guy's still working there, so I guess it, it must have worked for him. But, hey, examine the things that you need to do as, as a leader to move more towards this fulfillment. So let's not forget the strength and perseverance it takes to lead with empathy and inclusivity. Better leaders get better results. So to every one of you leading the charge for a more supportive and engaging workplace, I leave you with this. Stay bold, stay inspired, and remember that your actions today shape the culture of tomorrow. My name is Glenn Guyton. You have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful day.